Can you join me to give a round of applause to the next speaker, the highly recommended Jeff Campbell. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. That, that toss was actually like uh, Steph Curry's three points last night. <laughs> Whose team won last night, by the way? Woo! Oh, man. I'm not even talking to you today. I'm not even talking about you. Uh, he's still the goat, man. I don't care what you say. Um, all right, so today we're going to talk about uh, top digital trends of 2018. It's going to be a little bit different, okay? It's not going to be me lecturing to you. It's going to be about brainstorming together as a group. Um, so this does require a lot of group involvement. And with that, uh, we have uh, joining us on the stage uh, someone who has kindly volunteered to, to be up here and be uh, a part of this presentation. Our Uber Sarah with Toshiba, please give a round of applause. You get the seat of your choice, Sarah. Don't worry, you're going to be joined. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to walk on the side? Yes. Let's get, let's get you safely on, on stage. So, we have a couple of other seats up here. And these are great opportunities for someone in the crowd who likes to talk who knows just a little bit about digital marketing and wants to score tons of brownie points with their boss. Do I have any recommendation or any, uh, anyone to volunteer so far? Okay. So, so, okay, so, okay, so, hold on, hold on. We got two people halfway sold. I can work with this, okay? So, out of you two people, you're going to get huge brownie points with your boss. Because I am you're gonna, the boss. You are the boss. So then you're going to get, you're going to get to promote your business on stage. This is recorded, so it is online all year, right? Okay, I'm not finished selling. I'm not finished selling you yet. We have a LinkedIn. We have a LinkedIn database of about sixty thousand people who are going to get this. All right. She sold. <laughs> step right up. And I'll actually step this way up. And on the way up, if you will, please. Uh, well, I'll let you get upstage. How about that? Her name is Lisa. <laughs> I couldn't read the last name on her tag. <laughs> But Lisa Stauber, and which company are you with? Uh, I'm with Berkey Owl Media, and we, is this even on? Is it on? Is it going? Is it going? Is it going? Oh, there we go. Uh, Berkey Owl Media, and we run the Blog Elevated Conference, where we teach bloggers how to blog, and you said I put on myself. Go for it. So our next one, <laughs> um, National Social Media Day, which is June 30th, is our next one here in Houston, where we're covering all things social media for bloggers and people who write for the web. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Have a seat. You get your choice. Okay, so she's almost so. So what if I told you that everyone that joins me on the panel gets five extra entries for the Samsung watch? Did you say five extra entries? Five extra entries to possibly win the Samsung watch. Five extra entries. Are you sold? Does that close the deal? Come on down. <laughs> you can bring coffee, of course. We might even serve you coffee if you're if you participate. So, Kayla, tell us about yourself and your, and your company. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kayla Halchek. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, and I work for Patriots Point Naval and Maritime Museum. We're home to the USS Yorktown aircraft carrier. So, we're a naval and maritime museum. Awesome. Yeah. Going to be a great addition to our panel. <laughs> Step right up. Okay, so the rest of you, yes, thank you so much. So the rest of you are also on the panel. You're just not on the stage, okay? So pay attention because this thing could be hurled at you at any second during this presentation, okay? And, and of course, protect the coffee, right? So let's get started with Digital Trends 2018. And this is just something that I like to remind everyone about. Um, you know, we talk about everything at these conferences and all the new things that are happening, and we dive deep into everything. So I think the challenge for us as marketers basically is to understand how to take all of this new things that are happening and still be unique when we're integrating this into our marketing programs, right? 
I mean, isn't that pretty challenging? I mean, we want to be all things to all people and participate in all things, but at the same time, how do we be great at it and how do we be unique at marketing? So, first up, the first thing I think we all need to realize in 2018 is you are a broadcast media company. Whether you own a business or whether you work for an agency, you actually determine the audience. Many of you are part of the production staff. Some of you have even become part of the talent, <laughs> and you didn't realize it, right? Um, you also select the distribution channels, so think about that. And then you're also in charge of monetizing that audience and that distribution. That's basically a broadcast company. And a lot of times we don't think of ourselves now as the broadcast company, but we've moved from basically working with and buying from broadcast companies to um, being the broadcast company ourselves. So, is there anyone here that has experienced this recently, um, any of these areas recently, uh, that, could, that could talk about it? Crickets. It always happens, don't worry. I'll get you, I'll get you. All right, so how many of you have been on air for like a Facebook post, uh, Facebook Live recently? Okay, so that's how I get you. You raise your hand. All right, so talk to us about what you're doing as far as, uh, were you in the talent industry? Were you a journalist? Were you someone who studied no. to be in, in the industry? Okay, so how did you end up broadcasting out for your company? Um, well, I'm our social media manager, so whenever it's like, hey, let's do a live, who wants to do it? I get the crickets, and yeah. then I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do it. Yeah. So. So what have you learned by doing this? Are you better at it than you thought you would be? I, maybe it's not as scary, I don't know. It's not as scary as it, sh I don't know, it shouldn't be scary and it's not scary. It's just like, okay, get in front of the camera, nobody's really gonna care who you are as long as you're giving them something or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's, nobody cares who you are. Um, I don't know, that it's, it's easy and it's fine. Yeah. But I'm like an extrovert anyway, and I like talking sometimes when, when I've had coffee. So, I mean, if, we, if you were asked to like jump on stage or something, you're like the type of person that'd be like, sure, why not? After the coffee. Okay, so when you, when you finish <laughs> the coffee. That's why I'm not there. <laughs> okay. I mean, I might not jump on the stage, but I'll, I'll do it eventually. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Okay, so this is the warm-up slide. So the next one is mastering micro moments, okay? And how many of you have a smartwatch on today? Uh, I'm, you're not going to have to come on stage, I promise. <laughs> but, so now you can tell me, okay, how many of you have a smartwatch? Okay, how many of you have one in your family? Okay, so you can see, see the numbers there. Faster user experience, uh, faster search options, simpler design, just some of the real basic fundamentals of what that provides us. You know, when we were in uh, New York, I found it interesting because I was out walking, which I learned you do a lot of when you visit New York. Um, so I went into the mall, and I walked into the mall, and this huge, you can't really tell how massive this display is, but you can see the escalators behind it. If you look, this huge display is staring at me, so of course, since I'm doing this top trends, I had to snap a picture of it, right? But the main point here is that, you know, a lot of us, when we think of smartwatch, we think of Apple, and we, now we think of Samsung, you know? but almost every watch company now is in this already. Um, so you got Fossil here, Garmin, of course, Samsung, uh, LG, um, went into the Louis Vuitton store. How many of you knew that Louis Vuitton has a smartwatch? Yeah. How many of you have the smartwatch from Louis Vuitton? It's actually not that bad. I mean, it's like three grand, I think, three or four grand. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's like a third of the purse, just in case. Uh, and believe me, I know. Uh, not for me, but I bought it as a gift. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, and then the Tag Heuer uh, just came out with a smartwatch. It's about three grand as well. Rolex is working on theirs. Of course, they want to roll theirs out, you know, make it much more grander than, than Tag Heuer. But my point is, is that this is something we have to deal with in 2018, because if you look at the smartwatch trend of sales, look at how it's trending. You know, look at that trend line. So... Just kind of curious as far as micro moments, uh, what your experiences have been in that area and how you're currently using micro moments. Another example of this is, 
There was another mall uh, connected to our hotel. <laughs> I'm starting to sound like I go to malls. Um, but anyway, so I walk into Nordstrom's, walk out, check my phone when I get something. Actually, I went to get something to eat. So I'm checking my phone, and I get an email from Nordstrom's with a deal, right? So that happened because of something that happened in Nordstrom's that triggered that email. You know, it wasn't a just lucky experience. And then also, if you look at how the searches are happening, uh, searches for what's the weather today have grown over 160% over the past two years. So when I walked over to the salesperson at Louis Vuitton and I asked, you know, what's, what's great about this watch? You know, uh, what is Louis Vuitton doing that's, that's different from everyone else? I was surprised. She didn't really have a lot to offer me. Um, she said, basically, um, you know, we have some cool apps that you can download that are the Louis Vuitton apps. And then, of course, you can, uh, what everyone loves is you can instantly get your weather. And I'm thinking, okay, that doesn't sound very, it's not like a $4,000 feature there. Um, but when you look at this and you see that, you know, searches for what's the weather today have grown 160% over the past two years, then you start to realize why she mentioned weather as a feature because it is something that people are very interested in knowing about. How many of you have Alexa in your home and you ask, what's the weather today, you know, before you get dressed? Okay, instead of turning on your television, right? So these are, these are micro moments. The other thing is nearly a third of all mobile searches are related to location. Um, I'm always curious to see how many of you searched for something in Houston, if you're not from Houston, and you added near me. Or if you do that when you travel. I mean, all of us, right? And no one ever told me to do that. I just did it, right? Um, over the past two years, searches for local places without the qualifier near me have also grown 150% faster than comparable searches that do not include near me. So I found that interesting as well. Yes? That's yeah, what, see, that's why I wanted you on the panel. <laughs> I just wanted a, a little value add in here. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, the marketing of these products, uh, they try to build this personal relationship with you. And I know because I, I've had that one that's in the middle, the Samsung one, right? And I don't have it now because I lost it at a hotel, right? Okay. So, Oh, wow. I don't want to see the time there, and I want to see you know, a picture of a uniform or something, or, or go in there and actually build my own. I want the weather in this corner. I want my news here. I want this feed to come in. I think Samsung has it to where you can log into their stuff and add the, you know, not even knowing any coding skills, drag and drop in your own campus, right? And so now you've got a fully customizable watch that no one in the world is walking around with that uniform on there because you designed it, right? So that it's, a, it's a really good selling point. Yeah, this is mine. This is my watch, right? that is a good point. Even the aesthetics of the watch uh, are being customized for us because uh, that reminds me, I did get the, the Tag Heuer watch and I noticed that the Samsung and the Tag Heuer, um, you can change actually the color of the screen. Um, so if you like a blue screen or if you want a black screen or if it's a silver kind of day, you could have silver. So, I mean, they're customizing even the aesthetics of what it looks like. It could look sporty or it could look you know, something more conservative and professional. So yeah, it's a very good point about that. <laughs> and then also uh, in the search context, uh, a lot of you doing search now, a lot of you aware of this beta that's, that's happening right now with Google with the buy now feature. So you search for, uh, what do they search for? Dark blue chukkas on Google. And you, of course, get this long list uh, of different chukkas that are available. They give you the brand name. They give you the price and where it's located. And you can scroll until you find the price or the, the style that you like, either on mobile or on desktop. And now you can click the Buy Now button, and you don't even visit the website. It basically, you know, t if you're on an iPhone, it takes a... Uh, facial recognition of you to ensure the purchase is okay, and those chuckas are in the mail. You don't visit a website. So that's, that's what Google's doing in these, in these micro moments. So I'm curious to hear some of your comments about how you're using or if you're using um, marketing to these micro moments. Um, 
as people are going along the journey. This is the part where you get to talk. <laughs> or if you've experienced something like this, like the email or, you know, the, the text that hits you right when you're walking past the store. Come on, come on. I know it's early. There we go. Two more entries into the Samsung Watch giveaway. Um. So at, I work for Clayton Homes, and one thing that we do is the mobile location targeting and geo-targeting. Um, so if you think of like life events when somebody would want to buy a home, it's usually like divorce, marriage, um, their family's growing. And so we would put um, geo-targeting or a geo-fence around like a divorce attorney. So when someone is sitting in the office. Uh, you're so smooth. Um, yeah. <laughs> So when someone's sitting in the office and they're scrolling the internet or something, they'll see a Clayton Homes ad. And so that's just like a little moment to catch them. They may not be like ready to buy a home right there, but we're at least top of mind maybe in the future if they are. So just an idea. Very good example. Um, how many of you are using a lot of geo-targeting and building fences around your competitions? Doing that? Yeah, so we have a, a client and we build a, a geo-fence. Actually, I'll just hop down here. So we build a geofence around their competition and shoot display ad ads at them as soon as they drive onto the lot. And then when they leave the lot, we can determine how many times they click the ad. And then we can determine how many times they clicked the ad that we served them and then drove to our lot or our client's lot. So not only can we track how many people we reached, but we can track how many people were reached and then drove to our location as a result of that ad. So very, very cool. Uh, anyone else have anything? How about some micro moments over here? Anyone using that? Okay. Yes. Okay. So like I said, I work for a museum and I said I was from Charleston, but our museum is actually located in Mount Pleasant. But most people have never heard of Mount Pleasant, even though we're just across the bridge. So that's posed a big challenge for us because we want to say we're in Charleston, but a lot of times, like with TripAdvisor even, you search things to do in Charleston, we don't pop up because we're not allowed to because TripAdvisor is very difficult. But right. um, So we do geofencing to all of the museums and stuff. There's an aquarium downtown, so anytime someone's downtown, we'll... Um, or even just driving across the bridge, we'll ping them and say, hey, did you know about Patriot's Point? And then you, and then we'll give them, you know, little location maps so that they know where to go and try and get them that way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good idea. And, and consumers really don't even know this is happening, right? I mean, we're getting more educated as a consumer, but for the most part, we don't realize that, oh, it was like it was meant to be, you know? <laughs> there it is in front of me. So, uh, I'm with Toshiba International Corporation, and anytime we say Toshiba, everybody thinks TVs, laptops, computers. Um, we're not that. <laughs> we're the manufacturing, we're, we're the, on the industrial side. Um, so we actually manufacture motors and drives, um, power electronics at our place here in Houston. Uh, is we have a trade show coming up in Milwaukee, and the way we use the geolocation is, you know, it, it, on our pages, like if you were to hit on a product and you're like within 10 miles of that trade show, it's going to start following you and showing you all our ads to get you to come in to our customer event, come into our booth, you know, sign up, get an appointment, come, you know, talk to us. And that's how we've utilized it, the geo-targeting. So, okay. um, and it's been like, you know, you have to be careful with a lot of things, right? With the whole GDPR sure. coming up and, you know, data capturing, right, on people. but. Absolutely. Sneakily behind the scenes, right? Yeah, <laughs> all yeah. this happens, right? Yeah. Yeah, have all yeah. your your Got to get the policies. cookies, all the policies updated, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So with that in place, I mean, it's a very helpful tool. Yeah. So, so how many of you, by show of hands, are, spent, are planning to use this more, micro moments marketing in 2018, budgeting more for it? Okay, so a lot of you are already on that, on that path. Okay, as far as visual, you know, we've moved kind of from, you know, throwing these things on Facebook to trying to get more like this, right? Trying to share not only the product, but to show the experience and the emotional connection of someone actually using our product. And we're doing that through traditional display and we're doing it through video as well. So I'm kind of curious as to who in here works in content <clears throat> that can kind of share some of the transitions you've gone, to, gone through. So who do we have in content over here? 
Yes. It's like the second thing I've caught in my entire life. <laughs> um, my name is Sharon. I'm the director of marketing for a fitness um, boutique franchise. And um, prior to our kind of new team that we have, our retail was, that looks really cute. Let's make that. That looks real cute. And there was no theme. There was no tie to the brand. It was just anything they'd want to have in their closet. Let's sell that in the store. And um, so it's great that we're tying that more to the brand. But um, now the we just designed the, our next line of retail. And we have a whole storyboard and video shoot telling the story. Similar to what Chanel does. They're like, oh, it's inspired by her childhood and the summer breezes of Provence or whatever. And then you just tell the story. And so we've done the same thing with our next line of retail to sort mm -hmm. of tie that emotional connection to these t-shirts that have different icons that represent the story and our brand. So, so I'm you're hopeful. going more Fingers from, crossed. <clears throat> excuse me, you're going more from showing it on the rack or a yes. lot of small boutiques, you know, they would throw it down on the on the steps or put it up against the brick wall or whatever. Instead of showing that, you're showing, you know, the live experience inside that. And what's really cool is this year is probably the first year out of 15 years in marketing where my clients are actually saying things like, I mean, he had a boat dealer and he's like, I'm tired of showing boats. I want to show the experience of riding on a boat. I want to show kids on the tubes. And I'm going, man, you're speaking my love language there, you know, because because for so long, when you go to a boat dealer's website, you just see these boats, right? And you're just, it's kind of like a car. You're just choosing color and style, and that's it. But selling that fun, and I've noticed if you go to brand sites, and, and a lot of you have noticed, when you go to brand sites, um, even some of your retailers that sell these brands, they're looking at these sites and going, I don't understand this, you know? They don't even show the product. They're just showing this movement and this video. Well, they're... they're selling the experience of the brand, not the product itself. So very interesting how that's kind of, how that's kind of moved. Yeah, let's toss it to her, watch your coffee. All right, so I'm Dana Zambon. I am the blog manager and editor for Insperity. It's a Fortune 500 HR outsourcing company here in Houston. And one thing I can say about what has transformed our content as well is focusing on that connection and that problem solving, particularly with our blog. We've seen it become the largest generator of new business leads, mm -hmm. and that's you know including paid advertising, and this is just all organic searches, um, by focusing on what are those, because our, our niche market is small businesses mm -hmm. that typically may not have their own um, HR department or, you know. And so we focus on those pain points that are so common to startups and small businesses as they begin to grow. And the blog is just all about all those types of things and how they can solve them, but more importantly, letting them know you're not alone. Everybody who's ever started a business goes through this or will at mm -hmm. some point. And we found that it's really just been transformative by focusing on that. Sure, so. and you're capturing, and you're, you're capturing those people who are searching for answers or how right. to. Exactly. I mean, how many of us have, you know, especially if you own a business, you're like up late at night, how to do this, how to do that. And then you run across this blog that you found that's right. explaining how to solve this problem. And exactly. versus an ad, which you're not looking for, you're not looking to buy an HR partner yet, but you're looking for information and now you're supplying that information and you've just now built a bridge into your, into your company, Absolutely. which transforms into leads because, you know, they don't know how to do the, how to execute what they just read, but right. you do. And so. we get tons of emails from like our sales team that, you know, says, oh, this customer came to me because they subscribed to the blog and, you know, we, we've got that just firsthand proof that it's working and, mm -hmm. and also letting them know that when you have somebody that can take care of the administrative headaches for you that mm -hmm. come with running a business, then you can actually focus on the business itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Thanks. So next, uh, voice. So uh, we kind of touched on this with Alexa and all of that, that that's happening in the, in the voice space. Um, found this really interesting. How many of you believe this? You know, stats are stats. How many of you believe this? I mean, I think it could even be stronger. 
Um, and the reason why is because of, well, I'll show you that slide in just a second. But I mean, here are some of the, the options that we have when it comes to voice or live streaming. And some of us don't even know about these. Um, I mean, my 15 year old son's on Twitch. Um, you know, all of these services are now going to live um, and going live. And, and what's interesting I found about voice is that this is one of the, the only technologies or tactics in marketing, if you will, that we're so far behind on. The consumers out there, 70% of them want to use it more than what they're allowed to use it for today. And if you think about that, if you have Alexa at home, Sometimes you get a little bit frustrated because you're like, you know, you want Alexa to answer more of your questions than she's able to answer and do it a little bit better. Even though it's already incredibly amazing what that does, it's still lagging as far as our consumer demand in that space. And so I found that that's, that's an interesting space. And I'm just curious to know anyone that's already, uh, I'm sure Toshiba's already here, um, in fact, I'll let you kind of talk about that. But I'm curious to know um, what you're doing to research or if you're already involved in positioning your business uh, for voice. Sure. Um, so first question about your son on Twitch. Is he one of the ones making like $100,000 a month live streaming? Well, we're going to get to him <laughs> in just a second. That's amazing. <laughs> Right. Um, I, I think we're, we're just in this culture where it's instant gratification, right? You only have like five or ten seconds, and if I'm not getting what I want, then I'm not interested, right? right. I, I can go to the restroom, and if I put my hands under that sink faucet and it doesn't turn on, <laughs> right, I'm upset, right? You, you want yeah. me to turn you don't, it? You right. actually want me to yeah. turn that? Yeah, like, what do you not, want yeah. me to? Yeah, no, you know. Um, so, but, the, you know, these statistics, they're very true, right? Everybody's on their mobile devices, right? You're either going to talk... To Alexa, are you going to talk on, you know, to Siri on your phone, on your tablet, right? Even the ATMs now, right? You can hold your phone up, right? The Apple Pay, love it. You just yes. show the guy your phone and it pays for you, right? Exactly. Um, so, yeah, Toshiba. Siri, remind me of yes, this exactly. 4 o'clock on Thursday. Right, like, I don't want to think. Do it for me right yeah. now, right? So, um, Toshiba is definitely moving into that field. Um, our, my Marcom department over there, you know, which <laughs> is my graphic guy and content and video, but um, we're definitely going down that route because um, it is a market to be in. So, yeah. Um, so it's new, but is, uh, do you have anything that you could share as far as what you're looking into as far as voice? Um, <laughs> nothing? Yeah. I usually get the proprietary answer when, uh, when we go to that because it's so new and it's so fresh. But how about anyone out here? Let's ask you this. What, how do you see how voice even if you're not doing it yet, how can voice help your business? So going, going to your previous question, um, I do a lot of content, but also SEO and search. And one thing that we've started really focusing on is when we're doing our snippets or our metadata is making sure that first it sounds normal if, a, if Siri were to read it back, and also making sure we're avoiding strange words or things that are easily misconstrued or even things that are homophones that people might misunderstand. So we actually read our snippets out loud as though if somebody said, Alexa, what's the best? pork rib recipe or whatever, right. and it reads back, it, it sounds normal. And we also do that with directions too. So sometimes on our sites, um, I do a lot of local stuff and there's some streets in Houston like Kirkendall that Alexa butchers. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so we try to avoid that. We're like, okay, you turn left off Luetta. We don't say on to Kirkendall because the voice search can't say that word. Um, so it's something that we're very aware of when we're doing our snippets because we're always trying to get picked up in that feature. So I don't know if you know, in search, Google has started kind of scraping websites and they'll put this little featured box and you get no link juice or anything for it, but they basically steal the answer off your website and put it in a box. And it's not paid and if you can get the feature box, it's good and bad for your SEO. But we're trying to get into the feature box and in order to do that, we have to have the most voice friendly answer because usually people will say okay google what blah 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 and then it google or siri or whoever will automatically answer and read off whatever's in that feature box from google that's what they read 
And I'll kind of just add to that because um, we work really closely with the CVB, um, the Visitors Bureau in Charleston, yeah. and something that they're doing is blogging. They are creating blogs that would answer those questions that people are asking so that they are the first ones to pop up because people aren't going to search, they're just going to the first answer to the question that they have, and then boom, they pop up, and then they, you know, then they go to the rest of the things that they didn't even know they were going to get to. Very good. Yeah. We actually have that. Really good example, too, with, with how you're changing your yeah. search to match voice. We, I was going to say, we actually have that on our blog template. So when we send something out for content to our writers, we have um, keywords. It's, it's kind of like an assignment sheet, I guess. Um, so it has the keywords, like four or five keywords that they're supposed to hit because it's writing for the web. And then we have search queries, so it'll be mm -hmm. what where should I go in Charleston or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's the search query that we're trying to answer. And then the next one goes to, I don't know, five or six slides back because the next line is evoke. So it's what emotion are we trying to evoke from this um, piece? So maybe, because I, I work with all kinds of bloggers. So some bloggers are um, like mommy bloggers and they want to tell a really poignant story. So they want to evoke sadness. So it's not always evoke interest in buying our product. Um, it might be anger, or um, if, if it's a politician, they might want to invoke righteousness, righteous indignation, or whatever it is. Um, so we have evoke, and then we have you know how long it has to be and all that other nitty gritty stuff. But we have that right at the top. Mm -hmm. Keywords, um, search query, evoke. Yeah. So you add the word evoke, just to clarify, you add the word evoke to your search. Yeah, it's on search. our assignment sheet. Okay. So what, we send it out to writers, and they know we send our assignment sheet to, we have some VAs that do content writing for us, mm -hmm. um, and then they know uh, what, what tone the piece is supposed to take. Mm -hmm. like, so we always start with the end in mind, kind of what, going back to what Clover was talking about yesterday. When you're doing storytelling, you always want to think, what do I want the reader to feel? Because we're all in word content. We're, I don't do a lot of video, so it's all reading. So by the end of the piece, what do we want the user to feel? whether it's interest or curiosity or, like I said, indignation, so they rise up and march or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, because that tells us what tone the whole piece takes. Sure, sure. Very good. Did you have more to add? Okay. So someone else that can see how voice uh, could benefit your business or possibly some things you're looking into? Um, I work for a credit union in Oklahoma, Tinker Federal, we're the largest credit union in Oklahoma, and so we're about to, we're working on integrating with Alexa, our core system, so that members can say, hey Alexa, what's my balance in my savings? Hey Alexa, you know, transfer $100 from savings to checking or things like that, um, just because we've seen the research and we're actually really slow to uh, adopt anything, so the fact that we're doing this now, I'm giving our team a lot of props yeah. right now. Yeah, financial institutions are usually very Especially slow. credit unions. I've talked to some people. You know my <laughs> sadness. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so it'll be um, really interesting to see how that rolls out and how our members adopt it. Um, but I'm glad that we're kind of trying to get on the forefront of that because there's not a lot of, especially in Oklahoma, credit unions or banks that are have done that yet. So... Yeah. I'm excited. To I mean, it. yeah, it's, it's exciting to hear that you're already moving in that direction. Anyone else? I have a question for you. Sure. Like what steps are they taking to do that? Um, so, uh, so the steps to do that, we, uh, we tried to work with Amazon directly, but trying it, how we wanted to customize it was it wasn't working out. So now we've gone to this vendor that does our core system, Scimitar, and so they are, um, they have a team that is, has done the customization already, so we are working with them to take those steps. So um, right now we're about to like give them all of the answers that we want Alexa to say, and then we're going to move into testing, I think in the next four weeks. Um, so does that answer your question? Do you have like an app, I'm guessing, that would then connect to Alexa? Yeah, so with, um, with Alexa, they have apps that you'll download. Mm -hmm. in, your, in your Alexa app, you will then pick, um, they're called, 
I can't. Skills. 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 Thank you. Skills. You'll pick the skill. See how so this like all just works together. See, it's so beautiful. Working. Yeah. Uh, so they will download whatever skills they want to add to their Alexa. So they'll download the Tinker FC skill, and then they'll be able to, you know, integrate their um, their account number and everything, and log into their online banking. And, and are you doing it for Google Home too, or Google? we're doing Alexa first. Okay. Um, I think that's on the roadmap, but right now we're just trying to see how this first one goes and shakes out. Good. So anyone in here uh, do that for companies? Set up voice? Because if not, we got a great plug for, was it Scimitar? Yeah, but they're just credit union, it's banking. Software. Oh, so it only works with, with banking, okay. And then of course, you get into your apps and you look for skills. So some good information there. Um, next, looking at data-driven marketing. I think we've been kind of looking at data-driven marketing for a long time, and, and we've got all the data that we have time to analyze. But I'm curious how people are now uh, di actually digging into data and actually using it as a way to change your, how you're marketing. Back to my panel, I guess. I know you're using data, but I'll go to Toshiba first. Right, so for Toshiba, again, since we are a manufacturing company, uh, the way we utilize our data is you, with our customers who, for example, if we have a drive out in the field, and this kind of gets into the whole IoT, the Internet of Things, where you have your applications you know, talking to each other. Um, if a drive were to go down in the field and that information, we collect that information, so you know you don't have to send, your, you know when to send a field service guy out there, right? If something, you're like, oh, this is the data here is showing that it's about to fail or the data is showing that it needs more, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. then we can, our field service is, is you know, notify that, hey, um, you want to take a look at this data, right? Mm -hmm. So there's kind of this um, preventative maintenance that goes on. Okay. So that's how we use our data, right? It's, it's, it's understanding, um, you know, the, all our, our drives, our motors, um, in these appliances and how we can help make the customer have this seamless experience, right, without them even knowing that anything's about to happen, right, so. Okay, so uh, just to go a little bit further in that, um, do your, since you mentioned service drivers going out to these uh, clients, are you using an app for that or some sort of software program? Right, or? so right now it's all data driven, right? Okay. So, I mean, this is strictly in-house, right, between okay. our, our field service reps and what goes on with that drive, right? Okay. So that information is fed into our servers. Um, now we do have a sister company that has these um, smart goggles that we are about to push out there. And what it does is that also collects data. You know, while you're working, you know, it's hands-free and, and it collects all the data. It takes a camera, you can scan stuff. You know, the people who do like an Amazon, right? When they're sure. doing their shipping, they just look at the barcode, it just captures everything, mm -hmm. right? So um, that's how we're utilizing our data and um, just, finding ways to automate sure. all our systems. I was talking to someone recently who's in, who uh, use, utilizes service drivers, and one thing that I found that was interesting as far as data and marketing is they're cross-training their service techs, and let's say this is like a lawn maintenance service uh, of sorts, big company, but uh, so if they go out on a service call to a client, their data they've collected will tell that service driver hey, you have three uh, customers of ours that are within a block or half mile of that location, and that service driver stops at those locations and just greets them, how are things going, we have a new promotion that we're offering. So they're using that service call and their data for marketing to also create a sales opportunity in the field, which I thought was, was really nice. So, um Going back to the content side, we use our data really to inform our content, either to change it, to make it better, to keep people on the page longer, or also to make money. So, um, for example, a, a blogger that's, that's a food blogger, she had a, one of the things that I do to support blogger, just general bloggers, is do their analytics for them and give them a report every month because they usually aren't. Um, they don't know how to read it. Like you open Google Analytics and it's overwhelming and they don't know how to pull that data out. So she had a recipe and she had put an unusual ingredient in it. I think it was um, turbinado sugar. And she and this page was that the bounce rate on the page was pretty high. Not the bounce rate, the um, 
time on the page was lower than her other pages. All her other pages were higher. And we found, and so looking at the data and searches, and then also um, the custom search box that you can put on your website, the Google custom search, we saw there were a lot of searches in the custom box for that ingredient, turbinado sugar. So we figured out that people were leaving because they were Googling what it was and where they could get it. <laughs> and so she just put it, so we just changed her content a little tweak. So she put turbinado sugar and then um, in parentheses, or you can use brown sugar, but I use turbinado sugar because X, Y, Z, and then a link to Amazon. Uh, and nice. she, her clicks to her affiliate link went up, her income went up, and her time on page went up because people weren't going to Google to figure out whatever it is. So we do that with um, all of the top, like, you know, your top 10, your top 50 posts, and kind of continually improve them like that to keep people on the page longer and then give them a place to go that hopefully is monetized. Great example. Mine is more of a question for everyone. Um, just like, as far as data goes, what your favorite tools are that you use to analyze your data? I mean, because we use a whole bunch, but I'm always interested to hear what other people are using and why they like it. That's good. I'm sure we have a, some comments on that. Yeah. Um, we use a, a third party for our search engine optimization and all that, and we use a, a, a separate program called Hotjar, and it um, you you click on the different pages of your website, and it um, it highlights uh, like red is the most clicked item, and the like yellow and green is the the least click, and it shows the fold, and um, it's kind of interesting because we've seen that uh, like customers are trying to click on certain things that aren't clickable, or there you can even there there's a live option where you can see where their their mouse is going they're either reading and then they're getting distracted by something over here so it's really interesting to see in real time what is going through our customers head as they're on our website where they're clicking where they're trying to click where they want to go that kind of thing that's excellent heat maps that that's kind of what you're talking about right been around for a long time but my company is definitely using them more today than we did ever uh, in the past because of that real-time process and learning, hey, look at how many people are actually trying to get this information, and we, ha we don't have much content on this, on this page. Um, what else? Anyone else want to contribute? I know y'all use data. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who is it that loves KPIs? Was it you? You love KPIs? Um, so we are in the middle of a trial with Domo and uh, a BI tool, which... I am loving um, that you can kind of slice and uh, slice and splice the data any way you want. Um, gives me all kinds of page information, source attribution, the time on page. Um, it's just it's changing my world. I hope we sign with them, but I, I'm recommending <laughs> we sign with them. But I love it, and it's uh, it's not cheap, but it is. I think it's worth it. And you said Dono or Domo? Domo. Domo. D -O -M -O. Okay, so I knew Domo. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so we need to get them here next year, right? Talk about some data. So what else? Anyone else have a favorite kind of go-to? Not, not for data, but for social media. Yep. So I just started using brand mentions like two months ago. They had a sale. So um, you, it lets also let, if you're an agency, it lets you whitelist your reports for your um, clients. And what brand mentions does is basically it monitors your brand mentions. So if you're trying to see if people, what people are talking about when they're mentioning you, what the sentiment is, if it's a positive or negative sentiment, that kind of thing, it kind of pulls it all together in one interface. I'm really liking it. And then again, I can whitelist it for my clients. So I can create a report that has my stuff on it and send it to them, but it's very easy to read. It looks very professional. So I really like that one. And my other listening software that I use a lot is Agora Pulse. And what I like about that is from the social media side, um, I manage several pages that are international pages. They're not American pages. And with Agora, we get comments in all different kinds of languages. And it's one click, and it will translate it for you. It integrates with Google Translate. So I don't have to hire a native-speaking person in the Philippines and a native-speaking mm. person in India. We can have our one um, social media girl 
do just click and see what it is and she can type back an answer and it'll translate. Now I don't know how good the translation is back. Maybe it's terrible Indian or whatever. Um, but at least we can we can at least see if it's spam or if it's um, it's a religious page. So we can see if it's spam or if it's a prayer request or something legit that should stay or not mm -hmm. stay when we're not speaking that language. So those are two that I really like. So Agora. Agora Pulse. And then um, the other one was yeah. Brand mentions. Brand mentions, okay. So brand mentioning is, is included in a lot of social media monitoring software, but it sounds like this is kind of a niche where it's just mm -hmm. a lot easier to, if you're looking for just brand mentions, that's like it's right, it's, it's a lot more comprehensive, and then again, because I have an agency with clients, it's valuable for me just to, in a couple of clicks, I can send them a monthly report, mm -hmm. and I don't yep. have to, it like streams like so much of my VA time, Okay. Um, just to be able to white label those reports, so if anybody does agencies with clients, that might be a good thing to look into. Okay, good. So, that's okay, it bounces. So, the area that I have the least knowledge in, uh, and I'll admit, is blockchain. How many of you understand blockchain? <laughs> You're right there with me. Okay. So that's what, I, uh, that's what I thought. What's interesting, though, is it's definitely something that we need to pay attention to for 2018. Here are companies that are already using it. Uh, it's already well integrated into their daily operations within their companies. Um, and just mentioning it uh, at the table with Toshiba, it's something that you guys are already uh, involved with as well. So what do you do when you don't understand blockchain? You go find someone who does understand blockchain, right? So I found uh, 20,000 videos that explains what blo uh, blockchain is, and I sifted through every single one of them uh, almost and found one that I think does it as simply as you can do it. I'm not going to say that they're the most uh, uh, energetic people, but let's give this a shot and then we'll try to talk about blockchain. Blockchains are incredibly popular nowadays, but what is a blockchain? How do they work? What problems do they solve? And how can they be used? Like the name indicates, a blockchain is a chain of blocks that contains information. This technique was originally described in 1991 by a group of researchers and was originally intended to timestamp digital documents so that it's not possible to backdate them or to tamper with them, almost like a notary. However, it went by mostly unused until it was adapted by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009 to create the digital cryptocurrency Bitcoin. Now, a blockchain is a distributed ledger that is completely open to anyone. They have an interesting property. Once some data has been recorded inside a blockchain, it becomes very difficult to change it. So how does that work? Well, let's take a closer look at a block. Each block contains some data, the hash of the block, and the hash of the previous block. The data that is stored inside a block depends on the type of blockchain. The Bitcoin blockchain, for example, stores the details about a transaction in here, such as the sender, receiver, and the amount of coins. A block also has a hash. You can compare a hash to a fingerprint. It identifies a block and all of its contents, and it's always unique, just as a fingerprint. Once a block is created, its hash is being calculated. Changing something inside the block will cause the hash to change. So in other words, hashes are very useful when you want to detect changes to blocks. If the fingerprint of a block changes, it no longer is the same block. The third element inside each block is the hash of the previous block. And this effectively creates a chain of blocks and it's this technique that makes a blockchain so secure. Let's take an example. Here we have a chain of three blocks. As you can see, each block has a hash and the hash of the previous block. So block number three points to block number two and number two points to number one. Now the first block is a bit special. It cannot point to previous blocks because, well, it's the first one. We call this block the Genesis block. Now let's say that you tamper with the second block. This causes the hash of the block to change as well. In turn, that will make block three and all following blocks invalid because they no longer store a valid hash of the previous block. So changing a single block will make all following blocks invalid. 
But using hashes is not enough to prevent tampering. Computers these days are very fast and can calculate hundreds of thousands of hashes per second. You could effectively tamper with a block and recalculate all the hashes of other blocks to make your blockchain valid again. So to mitigate this, blockchains have something that is called proof of work. It's a mechanism that slows down the creation of new blocks. In Bitcoin's case, it takes about 10 minutes to calculate the required proof of work and add a new block to the chain. This mechanism makes it very hard to tamper with the blocks because if you tamper with one block, you'll need to recalculate the proof of work for all the following blocks. So the security of a blockchain comes from its creative use of hashing and the proof of work mechanism. But there is one more way that blockchains secure themselves and that is by being distributed. Instead of using a central entity to manage the chain, blockchains use a peer-to-peer -peer network and everyone is allowed to join. When someone joins this network, he gets a full copy of the blockchain. The node can use this to verify that everything is still in order. Now, let's see what happens when someone creates a new block. That block is sent to everyone on the network. Each node then verifies the block to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with. And if everything checks out, each node adds this block to their own blockchain. All the nodes in this network create consensus. They agree about what blocks are valid and which aren't. Blocks that are tampered with will be rejected by other nodes in the network. So to successfully tamper with a blockchain, you'll need to tamper with all the blocks on the chain, redo the proof of work for each block, and take control of more than 50% of the peer-to-peer -peer network. Only then will your tampered block become accepted by everyone else. So this is almost impossible to do. Blockchains are also constantly evolving. One of the most recent developments is the creation of smart contracts. These contracts are simple programs that are stored on the blockchain and can be used to automatically exchange coins based on certain conditions. More on smart contracts in a later video. The creation of blockchain technology piqued a lot of people's interest. Soon others realized that this technology could be used for other things like storing medical records, creating a digital notary, or even collecting taxes. So now you know what a blockchain is, how it works on a basic level, and what problems it solves. Want to learn how you can implement a simple blockchain in JavaScript? Then check out this video here. And as always, thank you very much for watching. <laughs> Anyone doze off? Um, so actually, I found that to be pretty simple. And you can tell me if you think I'm wrong, but I've spoken to about three different uh, experts in this field, and they've told me to really, really dumb it down and simplify it. Think of it as the most sophisticated Excel spreadsheet that is so encrypted that you can still share it with everyone, but if anyone tries to change anything that's been created before, then it won't happen because of the protection that's in place. So that's how I was explained what blockchain is. Um, going back to the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network, so one of the uh, world's largest or the world's largest timeshare company um, is already in this space or using blockchain. And one of the ways they're using it to completely revolutionize the entire timeshare industry is how people share time currently. Currently, most people call into uh, a call center and they say, hey, I've got this space in Hawaii and I want to go visit, you know, Florida and I need to check to see if this is available and if my points transfer and blah, blah, blah. And it's a long conversation. So what they're going to do is create an app where these people can go in and they can request where they want to stay. And by simply doing that, they can use the blockchain technology and the peer to peer network portion of that to make all of that happen within seconds, no phone call, no lengthy conversation, uh, nothing like that at all, saves on direct mail, brochures that they pass out. So that's just one way that they're using it. So I'm curious if anyone, uh, I mean, this is new emerging technology, a lot of your big, larger companies are using it. Um, curious if anyone's uh, in this space researching it, um, thinking it's good for your company, or already using it. So, 
On the content side, um, there is a project, a cryptocurrency and blockchain project called Poet Project, and the coin is Po, P-O-E. And what it aims to do is, using the blockchain, create a digital stamp that's a copyright stamp. So when anybody creates a work, an individual work, online, it's automatically put into the blockchain as belonging to them. And then you can use the coin to sell digital rights to um, a stock photo site for a year or to syndicate your content out. But it's kind of like a proof of authorship. So of course right now in, in the United States, when you create a work, say you write a blog post, you automatically have the copyright. But if somebody infringes on that, especially if it's somebody big, um, there is a big scandal where Pop Sugar took a lot of bloggers content and re-monetize them, and it was a big fight to show who actually published it first, and um, Google got involved, and it's really difficult. But when we have the blockchain, you'll have, as you create the work, every time you save it, it integrates with WordPress right now, every time you save it, it creates a new piece of the blockchain, a new hash in the blockchain, so you can prove that you're the originator of the work. Um, Minecraft is doing the same thing, and people laugh because they're like Minecraft. But Minecraft is a billion-dollar industry. Don't play with Minecraft. Let and me they tell have you. a they have a blockchain coin called Engine, um, E N J is what it is. And when it's fully integrated, when people when kids play Minecraft, you can go on creative mode and you can create all these really cool things. And it's not just kids; like I was the top say, yeah. that one of the top um, Twitch guys is actually a Minecraft guy, and he's a grown man. He plays Minecraft on Twitch all day long and makes a gajillion dollars doing it. Um, but what you can create something, so you create a tool or you create a dragon or something like that, and using this engine coin, it's going to be integrated within the Minecraft system where other people can buy that dragon. So you create this dragon and then you can sell it and they pay you an engine coin, which you can then, actually it's a traded coin, I own some of the engine coin because I think it's cool. Um, and it's a publicly traded coin on the crypto exchanges, so they could exchange it for money eventually, or just get, they'll, they'll probably just pile it up and buy other cool Minecraft stuff. <laughs> but it's very cool how it's um, democratizing monetization, and you also don't have to tie it to your bank account. So if your kid's selling something, um, you don't have to give them your Venmo or whatever. Yeah, excellent. I just want to say, you just blew my mind. <laughs> I just want to say it's amazing what can happen when you bring people out of the audience and put them on a panel. Yeah. <laughs> you want to talk more crypto? Anytime. So next is rallying your influencers. Okay. How many of you are using influencer marketing? We've all been using influencer marketing, right, through word of mouth and such, but we've taken it to basically to a new level. Uh, with different types of influencer marketing, and I'm curious to learn from you um, how you're using influencer marketing uh, currently. So we're not actually doing this yet, but I went to another conference and it was all about influencers, and so I think we're going to do it. Um, part of what we do at our museum is we have a camping program. So you, um, we have about 21,000 children who spend the night on board the um, World War II aircraft carrier that we have. Mm -hmm. And it's really difficult to reach them because most of them are, are Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts and their little troops are just so individual and it's hard to reach them. Mm -hmm. So we had this idea, what if we get a, a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout who has a lot of followers and a lot of influence and give them a free camping trip with their friends. Oh. And then hopefully they would then share that, everyone would see it and then we would get more campers. So that's something that we're, we're thinking about trying out but we haven't done it yet. Okay, yeah. yeah, sounds like a good idea. Yep, influencers. So Well, so two things and if I just back up real quick on the on the blockchain right because Toshiba our industry we're more of b2b right and I'm noticing it's a lot of b2c in this sure. space here right so b2b um, as far as blockchain goes uh, you have your suppliers right and most of them can be overseas and as she was mentioning where you can create your own coins right so now you you can say oh I need this supply in Japan which would normally take you know whatever it is two three five days for the wire to go through right. but we'll just change this coin right here using our smart contracts right mm -hmm. and it's done instantly and you've just cut out the middle guy 
and and now business, right? You're you're, you're seeing this Speeding savings, right? Is very efficient, right? Yeah. Now, right. So, um, I'll just, I just want to. I'm like, wait, yeah. I'm B to B. I'm not no. B to C. No, that's yeah. excellent. Yeah. And that's, it yeah. costs like a penny or less than a penny to do it instead sure. of a twenty five dollar wire transfer fee right. or whatever percent. Right. And then in regards to influencers, we're actually looking into the LinkedIn, right? The, those who, are, who have the blogs on LinkedIn or who, you know, for us, like the motors, you know, there's different, several motors groups, right? Well, right. which guy has the most pull on there? Follow that guy, get that guy, right? You know, exactly. and, then, and get that's, talking. that's how we're using LinkedIn to right. report to Shiba. And many of you in, increasing your time or budget in influencer marketing this year? Yes. So definitely a trend. Um, this has been amazing, guys. Really, it's been one of our best uh, kind of interactive sessions uh, in other cities. But we are running low on time, so I want to want to rush through the last couple of slides here. Um, so, any Fortnite folks in here? Come on, I know I know we got more Fortnite people in here. Okay, so back to my son and on the influencer marketing thing, uh, we had this joke where he plays so much video games. I was like, you know, and he's 15 and he's already going through the, you know, I don't want to be when I, I don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up. So one day he comes downstairs and he's like, Dad, I think I do want to be the, the, the guy that just lives with his parents and plays video games. <laughs> I was like, that was a joke. And <laughs> he was like, no, I can make money at it. And I was like, what? What's going on? He was like, I just got a hundred bucks. And I was like, how did you get a hundred bucks? He was like, well, I'm, you know, I've been playing Fortnite and I beat Drake. We did, uh, we did confirm that. So he did, he didn't record it. I was like, ah, he didn't record it. But so his friends though did, they watched it. And so uh, Drake is a big, apparently a huge Fortnite player, uh, the rapper. And so, and then he has a, a sidekick that's, I forgot what the nickname is, but, but my, my son's friend beat him. So it was like this really big deal. But then my son comes down and he's like, I'm, I just got a hundred bucks deposited into your PayPal account. And I was like, well, that's even better because it's my account. <laughs> um, but what it is, is uh, when he goes live on Twitch, he has, I think, 3,000 uh, people that watch him play Fortnite. And I was blown away by this. So this random sports energy drink now, um, and I'll have his video at our next conference because I got him to actually capture it. But this random sports energy drink company has now placed their sports energy drink right on the screen while he's broadcasting his game on Twitch and dropping 100 bucks a month into his PayPal account. So I'm like, I don't know about this thing. You're not living with us, but you might make money at it. <laughs> so and then rebalancing content, you know, we could talk about that, but we've really kind of talked about how we are using different types of content, whether it's live uh, we've also kind of touched on artificial intelligence, um, and, and also I think what's important most there to add to that is just try to keep it as human as possible. Um, so basically that wraps up Top Digital Trends of 2018. I usually have some time open for people to add a trend that they think is important or not. So I'm going to ask you if you have something that you think should be on that trends list or something that should be taken off, uh, tweet us and add that information and everyone follow and we can continue the conversation there. But uh, thank you so much for the session. It was very, very interactive. Thank yes, you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Thank you.